You can't hear. So, um, again, thank you very much for joining us today. We welcome you from all over. We have everyone. We have people joining us from all over the world. We have lots of people in Kenya. We have in Nigeria. I've seen some registrants from the UK, from all over. So, welcome all. And uh, welcome to Upande. So, smart farming is our discussion today. So, uh, without further ado, I want to first welcome our panelists. We have a very good lineup today. I don't know if I can share the program with you, but, uh, well, there's not much <laughs> to share with because it's uh, going to be a discussion. So, I will introduce, we have uh, the Cabinet uh, Chief Administrative Secretary for the Ministry of ICT, Ms. Uh, Maureen Baka. We have uh, Mr. Kirigai Kamau, uh, who's the lead at Godan Africa. We have Ms. Uh, Bernadette Mugo, who's the CEO of uh, Smart Farmer Africa. We have Mr. Timiu, who is a farm manager at uh, Olo Tepes Farm. Olo Le Tepes Farm. Am I saying that right, <laughs> Mr. Timiu? Uh, and uh, yes, we have Mark, who's uh, the CEO for Upande. So I'm just going to give them each maybe five minutes so they can uh, tell us about uh, themselves and um, their organization, what they do, and uh, how they contribute to this topic of smart farming today. Uh, yeah, then we can get into the discussion. So I will start with you, Ms. Baka. Please start us off. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. As, uh, as stated, my name is Maureen Baka. I'm the Chief Administrative Secretary at the Ministry of ICT, Innovation and Youth Affairs. It's a pleasure to be here with you all this morning as you discuss uh, smart farming and e-agriculture. Um, so I'm from, I'm at the Ministry, I sit at the Ministry of ICT, uh, Innovation and Youth Affairs, um, which is mandated with the formulation of ICT policies and laws that regulate standards and services in the ICT sector. It is also charged with the responsibility of developing and administering ICT standards, building capacity in uh, the ICT sector, and of course, dissemination of public information. The government as a whole supports and recognizes the role that ICTs play in all aspects of our lives, of course, including agriculture and, securing, and having food security in the country, and the potential growth effect that ICTs have on our economy. It, this is indicated by the policy documents that we have in place, starting from the country's development blueprint, which is Vision 2030, and the government development priorities, which have been spelled out by His Excellency the President in the Big Four Agenda. And with regard to food security, the President has stated that digital technology will support efforts to increase food security by playing a key role in the agricultural value chain through better access to inputs, more reliable weather and crop information, tracking of counterfeit inputs, more, and more transparent access to markets, including fair pricing. Digital technology also underpins a range of agro-financing services that are essential for equipping smallholder farmers across the country. Thank you, and I look forward to the discussion today. Sorry, thank you very much, Ms. Mbaka. That was <laughs> short, but thank you. I'll go to Mr. Kiringai. Kindly talk to us. Yeah. Let us know. Yeah, thank you them. very much. Um, and uh, a pleasure to be in this uh, Upade meeting. I'm delighted to see this uh, pulled off. Mark has been a friend for many years. Um, I'm Kiringai Kamau. I have uh, many things that I can describe 
what I do in, our, in the agricultural space, particularly in the way we apply, we apply ICT in the agricultural space. First and foremost, I'm a farmer, and I love talking about it more than I do that, talking about the other activities that I do, because I derive uh, some of the things I, I do in applying ICT in the agricultural space from my own practice and the teaching that I do. I teach at the University of Nairobi. Um, and I am also the Africa lead for Gordon, the Global Open Data for Agriculture and Nutrition. And um, other than that, I am an entrepreneur in uh, the ICT space. So uh, when I talk about uh, the application of ICTs, um, I am uh, at the nexus of how do you interface um, the mobile devices that you take to the field with the, the, the cloud infrastructure, with the computer servers and with the satellite infrastructure. And I'm able, because of the role that I play for Gordon, to demonstrate to policy institutions. I have been an advisor for the cabinet secretary for agriculture in Kenya. And I try to push this agenda a bit. Uh, they move a bit more slowly. But um, we now have uh, a policy engagement with the, with the government, and we are trying to do some work to do with the creation of a National Agricultural Open Data Council at every country in Africa. And we would actually be discussing more of that as we go. So it is my pleasure to be here, and I will be talking about uh, my goats because I'm a goat, dairy goat farmer. That is the area that I occupy in the agricultural chain. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Chiringai. Uh, Mr. Biketi, Mr. Simiu, <laughs> talk to us. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Selby, for this opportunity uh, and to welcome me to this much awaited uh, uh, webinar and to talk about uh, smart farming. Uh, my name is Biketi Simiu. I'm a scientist, I'm a farmer by profession. Um, I'm both an agronomist and uh, a zoologist. Uh, that means I'm, I major in both animal and uh, crop production. Um, I'm also a smart farmer. I love farming more than I can express it here. And especially when it comes to technology, um, incorporating technology into farming and uh, you know, looking at the results and achieving the output that you desired. It's good when you do things in a different way. Farming has uh, been done traditionally for a long time. Most of the things we've been doing, they were, they were invented uh, many years ago. But then, what is the outcome? Uh, are, we, are we going to be doing things the same old way we've been doing, or are we going to, to make a difference? You can see at our world, uh, I mean, life is so dynamic and changes the basis. We are, we are changing uh, in every aspect of our lives. There is a population increase, which means there is a an increase in uh, conflict uh, for uh, both uh, animals and plants, flora and fauna. Uh, there's in, uh, in increased uh, conflict on land use. So if we are to, for instance, uh, stick to our old ways of farming, whereby you, you, uh, your output is measured by how much input you, you, you accrue and uh, employ in your production system, then one day we will fail, uh, depending on how, uh, based on how life is, uh, is going and the present world is moving. So um, with technology, it has enhanced, and, uh, enhanced production, brought new ways and new methods such that we don't have to worry so much about uh, inputs, uh, having uh, enormous amounts of inputs for you to be able to, to produce and uh, maybe make profit from your farming. Uh, with technology, we are able to, to enhance efficiency in our production systems and be specific. You, you produce just what you need and also be, we have been able to even minimize on the wastage on the losses that we have been experiencing uh, in the conventional or rather traditional uh, systems of farming. So um, technology, when you talk about technology, it's, it's amazing when you're doing smart farming. Uh, I mean, uh, smart farming is basically farming with technology. 
modern way, modern systems of uh, food production, both animals and uh, crop production. So um, me being a great interest of uh, Internet of Things and technology in farming, it has uh, helped me so much in my work as a modern farmer. I'm the farm manager on the Tipis Aquaponic Farm. On the Tipis Aquaponic Farm, it's a smart farm, and um, it's basically an aquaponics farm. Most people wonder what aquaponics is. Most people know what it is. So uh, we are, it's some sort of integrated system. We have uh, established a permaculture system on the farm, and it's, uh, it's all integrated together. And uh, by, because of technology, thanks to technology, by use of technology, the forms of sensors, being able to monitor and evaluate all our operations on the farm, we have been able to integrate so many things into one system, into one production system. We, we are able to produce, for example, uh, if you want animals, we have fish, we have poultry on the farm, crops, we have uh, leafy greens, we have berries like strawberry, tomato, all of them in one closed loop. We have uh, integrated everything and formed one single loop. And what's amazing about smart farming is you can do it in any environment. Traditionally, people, farmers are choosy about where to do their farming. You can only do farming in certain locations. There are some places you, you will not want to do farming. But for, with smart farming, you are able to do farming virtually anywhere on the globe. All, all Lutipis aquaponics farm is in, the, in one of those areas where a conventional farmer will not want to try farming. It's in a semi-arid region in Kajado County. It's very dry. And if it rains, it pours. It rains, it's so heavy rainfall there. And if there's no rainfall, it's totally dry. So with these differences, it's very difficult to have a reliable farming system. But with technology, we've been able to create perfect micro environment within the larger hostile environment, specifically for our crops and animals, so that we just give them what it requires. And one thing I'm also liking so much about technology and what I would want to urge people to embrace is that smart farming, there's no wastage in smart farming. You, you only use what you need. You give the plant exactly what it needs. And what is left, you don't have to worry about it. You can always make it go, I mean, circulate and come back when the plant just needs it. There's no wastage, there's no loss. No water loss, no volatilization of uh, fertilizer and other essential uh, inputs on the farm. So you realize at the end of the day, you have saved a lot and you have minimized on your cost of uh, production on the farm. And at the same time, your profit margin broadens because you'll have more input and healthier. Smart farming, when most people hear about smart farming, they think about um, maybe rocket science, things that are impossible, uh, a lot of technology, machines and uh, chemicals. No, it doesn't have to be all that. Smart farming, you can do organic farming without any use of uh, uh, synthetic uh, materials in your production system. At Olytipics Aquaponics Farm, we are able to produce fish, vegetables, and berries, all of them 100% organic. Maybe I'll talk a little bit about uh, Olytipics Aquaponics Farm, how we have been able to incorporate and integrate all the uh, production systems on the farm. We have fish farming, the aquaculture, and uh, horticulture, which are doing hydroponics. So the combination of aquaculture and hydroponics is what will give us aquaponics. So we are able to utilize the disadvantages in fish production, which is excessive ammonification of the ponds, which consequently uh, will lead to uh, problems in fish production. When there's a lot of ammonia in water, fish will not grow. We all know that fish will not eat. It will have a lot of problem, health problems, muscles, muscle pain, it will not grow. The, the same effect uh, ammonia has even on, uh, on humans. So we'll channel the water, which has a lot of uh, uh, ammonia, to, uh, to the ponds where you have grown our crops, our, uh, our horticultural crops, hydroponically. The ammonia will naturally be converted into nutrients, that is nitrates, which will now, now be absorbed by the plants. A conversion of uh, ammonia to nitrates is our natural process. So it's, there is no chemical here, there is no uh, rocket science here. 
It's natural. We are embracing nature. At the same time, we are conserving nature. We are not introducing any foreign materials into our production system such that we will affect our flora and fauna on the farm. So uh, we, with, the, with that natural conversion, we are able to clean the water, get the excess ammonia out of the water by utilizing it in the plants. They will uptake it as fertilizer. So we do not even add any artificial fertilizer to our crops. Then the water with the little ammonia now comes back to, to the fish. Fish wants fresh water full, with, uh, full of uh, air, oxygen. But now, how is it possible to do all this? How can you be able to monitor uh, ammonia? How will you know that there is enough ammonia in this water to be channeled to the crop section? How will you know that uh, there is little ammonia in this water so it's safe enough for the fish? How will you know that uh, the temperature is right for the crops? For instance, I'm doing a horticulture, uh, uh, latest production. It, it needs very low temperature, less than 20 degrees. Uh, for fish, it needs more than 25 degrees. How are you able to know that all these temperatures are good enough for your production systems? That's when our technology comes in. Okay, we use sensors to, to make, I just log in to my computer and I see and I know, hey, I need to adjust this. And that's where smart farming now is really helping me. Yeah, maybe with time we'll continue discussing more. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Simu. Of course, being a smart farmer, you have a lot to tell us about smart farming. So we are very happy to have you on the team as well. So I understand Ms. Bernadette is having a bit of some technical issues. We hope she'll join us in due time. Uh, now we'll just have Mark tell us, talk to us. <laughs> All right. Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome. And we're very excited to uh, have our second webinar uh, today on, on smart farming and to have such a great uh, panel in place and, and uh, yeah, registrants from all over the world, we're very excited. And I think it also shows that this topic uh, is alive and uh, is very um, important for a lot of people. Um, so we're very keen to, uh, to get your feedback. Um, we have such a range of different uh, people have signed up that we might not be able to, of course, cover all of the potential questions that are there. But hopefully this can kick off now a series of doing these kind of webinars where we can jointly explore these opportunities and see what can be done in light of also what technology is allowing us to do with also increased pressures from COVID and, 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 and pollution and things like that that are affecting us and, and climate, uh, climate change. So without further ado, I, I'd like to share a few uh, slides. So um, I'm just going to um, bring this up. So I'll take you through a little bit about Upande. So Upande is a, a tech company started about 10 years ago uh, in Kenya. Uh, the, the name means location and direction. Um, we are building homegrown solutions that uh, uh, are cost effective and, and allow our customers to make data-driven decisions. So I just want to highlight a few things that we are doing in the, in the smart farming space. Uh, and I've called the, the slides uh, smart farming in a click. Um, one of the challenges, of course, is that a lot of farmers are not um, able to very effectively optimize their inputs, their resources. Um, and as a result, profitability is not nearly as high as it could be. Uh, and farming indeed is constrained to some areas like uh, Biketi has mentioned, uh, yet at the same time there's a great demand for food production and it's becoming more difficult also with climate variability. So what is it that we're working on as Upande? Uh, we've been operational for 10 years. We started in the water sector um, and we're now branching also into agriculture. Uh, that's what we've been doing during the last few years. So what is the the, what is it that we're able to offer in this space? Basically, it's smart uh, data-driven asset management. So basically, having systems in place that allow one to monitor their operations from anywhere in the world. So as you can see in this picture, uh, for example, having sensors in greenhouses that will give you 24-7, 365 days a year, every 10 minutes, some reading as to what the physical conditions are out there on your farm. This, of course, is great if you are not on the farm at all times, which, of course, in, in COVID periods is also very relevant. But it allows you to get a lot of insights as to how you might want to optimize your conditions. 
Uh, once you know what crop you have and what the perfect conditions are for the crop, then this will give you insights as to how to uh, how to change your management practices and, and to, to reduce the risk, for example, of certain diseases breaking out um, and actually increase your yield. Also be able to predict your yield, which is also increasingly important um, and uh, grow sustainably as a, as a company. So we've seen that by using technology, we've uh, gotten testimonials from some of our customers that they've received uh, increases, 5%, for example, just by applying you know, ventilation based on, uh, on how they actually uh, yeah, open and close the greenhouses at different times of the day. Um, so how do we do that? We have a few building blocks that, uh, that are particularly suitable for that. And uh, I just want to briefly mention them now, just to help also feed the discussion uh, with, with the panel. So we have two particular tools that we would like to uh, just talk about here. One is so-called ERP. And ERP is basically uh, an, uh, an, uh, yeah, an acronym for enterprise. And it's basically a tool where all information records, uh, farming records, um, accounting records, sales, expenses uh, come together. Um, so basically having live you know, management info just a click away. That's the one building block that, uh, that we are working on uh, with, with focuses on agricultural uh, sectors um, and, and others, by the way. Um, and then the other one is now uh, what we're calling VPMO. VPMO is the Swahili name for measurement. And basically it's the, the name for our Internet of Things tool. What is Internet of Things? It is basically connecting the physical world to the web. So that'd be example of the greenhouse that I showed you, where one is able to, uh, on their mobile phone, exactly be able to see what the conditions are like. So linking the physical world to the phone is some, uh, something we're calling the Internet of Things, or it's, it's a, a very popular growing space, uh, and we have local solutions for that. So on the ERP, as I mentioned, it's basically the idea is that you have all of your management information in one platform. So instead of having some data in Excel, some data in Word, some data in uh, QuickBooks, uh, and then many other tools that you may have, no, it's having all of that information in one place, in one account, shared with whoever within your organization uh, should have access to this kind of information. So information on the sales, uh, <clears throat> procurement, accounting, uh, CRM, HRM, your payroll, uh, <clears throat> your stock, and basically this allows you to uh, see at any point in time, without having to wait for the annual returns, <clears throat> how your company is doing. Um, what is now possible with an application like this is also to, um, to start benchmarking yourself against others. So the screen that you see there with the app uh, on the right it is an, an implementation that we are working on right now for aquaculture. So when you are taking uh, your records of the growth of your fish, you want to also know, are they growing at the right rate? When I give them high quality feed, does it mean actually that they're growing at the speed that they should be growing? Or is it a little bit below and what could be causing that? Because if you want to look, if, you want, if you're looking to get your best returns, you want to make sure that your inputs are, are optimized as much as possible. So being able to benchmark yourself against um, the standards, the scientifically known uh, performance of, for example, fish or even for crops um, uh, is, is key. Uh, potentially benchmarking against others too in the sector. These are the kind of things that are becoming possible with smart technology. Um, at the same time, also um, integration with sensors is possible. And that's uh, the VPMO product that we're talking about. So one, by basically, um, seeing what the growth conditions are like, maybe in, in a greenhouse, knowing what crop you have there, knowing what, it's, uh, what, the, the, what the, the conditions are like uh, for, for thriving, one can actually start doing also predictions, uh, you know, knowing what yields you should be having if you are on top of your information, which means that you will be able to sell probably at a higher price and maybe not only be dependent on the auction house and the, and the market rates, because you actually know what's coming down the road. Um, that's, that's the direction that we see uh, technology moving in and becoming more and more you know, reachable within reach for, for a, a larger number of farmers. Um, it is also possible to actually link 
uh, an ERP like this with so-called chatbots. So in the example of the app on the left, um, you can see WhatsApp. So by linking WhatsApp with ERP, uh, one is able to actually get to core information of the company, <clears throat> of the farm, through a, a simple social app like WhatsApp, um, which means that you don't have to go behind a, a desktop and log into some complex ERP. No, we're making this information just a click away. And, and all of this uh, is basically uh, starting at about $50 a month um, for per, per farm. Uh, with with several users that are able to access this kind of information. So this is a product that we're very excited about. So it basically allows you to work with crop cycles, which means that you can, you know, actually compare maybe one greenhouse versus the other one, maybe one field versus the other one, because you're you're basically splitting up your operational figures, your records, uh, and and seeing which part of your farm is actually, you know, bringing in the best returns. For so rather than looking at the total number, okay, where to do well, which which part of our operations contributed most to uh, to the to a successful year, you can actually know and actually uh, for subsequent cycles, perhaps focus on things that are are just doing better for you. Um, we through an ERP like this, it's also possible to very practically uh, give out tasks to other people within your organization. So this is something that we're calling the the to do app. So the to-dos that are actually tracked in the same ERP can be assigned to different uh, organiza uh, organizational staff members, which means that even for telephone farmers, you can remotely assign tasks to people and track whether they've been completed or not. And all of this information comes together in one place. Um, so this is particularly, of course, interesting for telephone farmers. And with all of the movement restrictions going on, uh, we think that this is uh, actually um, yeah, very timely. The other aspect that I had mentioned was the VPMO part, uh, or monitoring and tracking your physical assets remotely. As you can see in the picture, where a temperature and humidity sensor is placed, actually at uh, Olo Tepes uh, Aquaponics Farm, uh, Mr. Bichetti is, is managing. So what is this uh, about? It's about tracking, for example, your operations. So what are the kind of things that you can track on the right, you'll see a list of just a few examples of the ones that are relevant for, for agriculture. So the temperature, humidity in a greenhouse, maybe atmospheric pressure, uh, but also how much water is flowing. Uh, if you're running aquaponics or hydroponics and doing irrigation, these are very relevant informations. And by having this information online, one can uh, very safely uh, see from anywhere in the world whether your farm is actually um, where things are actually moving in the physical world. Um, it's possible to also measure water tank levels, but also pH and EC. EC is for conductivity. Uh, when you are irrigating your water, um, you're adding minerals, or in aquaponics, you have uh, minerals, of course, in there. You need to know how many minerals are in there. And uh, these are now uh, proxies, indicators um, uh, of, of the nutrient level, and therefore also whether you're the kind of yield that you're aiming for will be achievable. It's possible to have weather station uh, also uh, report on, on uh, in your climate at the farm, but even things like power usage, um, the door position, um, which can be useful to track uh, vehicles, perhaps uh, vehicle position and movement there as well, fuel level in the tank. There are so many things that these days can be measured with, uh, with devices that uh, don't have to be uh, very expensive uh, we, we the, the cheapest sensors as i've listed here start from about 50 dollars um, and uh, and are becoming more and more within reach for for farmers so basically by tracking consumption one can actually know where to save on costs so when you if you can reduce your power bill significantly that's going to pay off for uh, the use of technology quite quickly um, once you know what the facility conditions are you can tweak them so that your, your yield is going to go up. So it's going to pay for the, for the technology. Um, but also, yeah, by having a live understanding of uh, the physical conditions, you can actually do preventative maintenance and make sure that your, your repair and your maintenance costs are also going to be lower because you actually are doing preventative maintenance. So that's what, uh, what the, the Vipimo tool uh, helps you do. 
Um, we've been working with, uh, with, a, with a quite a few established names um, in the sector already and, and love to, of course, get feedback on this and, and discuss how such tools uh, perhaps um, are changing the, the paradigm of, of, of smart farming in the, in the panel discussion. And uh, yeah, we're happy to, uh, to explore uh, also beyond this, uh, uh, this webinar, of course, but uh, for now, um, I'll just leave it at that. And thanks very much for your time. Okay, thank you very much, Mark. That was uh, quite extensive, you know, information when it comes to the tech that uh, Upande offers for smart farmers. Uh, Miss Bernadette, we are so glad that you're able to join us. Uh, we were concerned, <laughs> but we're glad that you're here now. Uh, so we were just going around uh, saying a few words about ourselves, uh, what who we are, what we do and um, how we are related to smart farming. Yourself, you're the CEO of Smart Farmer Africa, so this would be fun for you, should be fun for you. Thank you very much, um, Sally, Selby. Uh, and uh, to everybody, I'm so sorry for the delay. It's just issues to do with this technology also. I use Zoom almost every day, but uh, today it just went down on me. So I'm so sorry for the delay. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, Mark, I'm grateful. Uh, as uh, you introduced me, I'm Bernadette Murgor, the CEO of Smart Farm Africa. Uh, Smart Farm Africa, we provide information to farmers. We, in, we uh, empower farmers with technology, I mean with, uh, with information. We support the sector. Uh, through various uh, ways. Uh, let me just show you a copy of our magazine. This is one of our magazines. And I'm sure many of you have seen our website. We offer a lot of information on various things in the agriculture sector. We love smart farming a lot. Uh, the reason why we're even called smart farmer is because we realized that uh, farmers really needed to farm smart so that they can. They can grow and make profits uh, from whatever they have, whatever size, whatever space of land they have, they can actually uh, make use of it and, and grow profits. So we are also a platform that uh, we offer services to uh, organizations such as Upande uh, and various organizations. For example, we support with the technical support like uh, writing articles, doing newsletters and, and all sorts of things. So, and, and for farmers, we, we really want to impact our farmers because we realize 70% uh, of Kenya relies on agriculture. 40% uh, of our farmers actually are directly employed there. And we want our youth to get into agriculture because people are looking for jobs, but the jobs are on the farm and there's money in farming. So that is why we are really there. We want to really give this information as smart farmer. And we want all of you to get into our website, buy our magazine to get this information because we really do in-depth uh, information on, on anything. Talk about avocados, talk about macadamia, talk about Upande, what they are providing. We will write about it all so that you, you get this information. Yeah. We can't hear you, Selby. Sorry. Okay. Thank you so, so much, Miss Bernadette. I am so glad to have you all here. It's, it's a wonderful panel. So this should be a very good discussion. So as you all know, I'll just I'll dive into it, yeah? As we know, as you all know, farming uh, in Kenya has been the backbone of our economy for the longest time. You know, at least that's what I was taught in school. <laughs> so, but right now we have very few people farming, more people leaving the farming sector and joining other business sectors because you know farming is not as fruitful as it used to be as you know with climate change and everything there's so much that has come up that is uh, getting in the way of uh, successful farming so today we are going to talk about that and before i forget we have a hashtag going on as a social media platforms that's a hashtag uh, smart farming feel free to join in the conversation uh, we would love to love. We would love to hear what you have to say. So, farming, smart farming. I, I, we have a 
list of questions, give or take, not exactly a list of questions, but uh, uh, a, a list of talking points, maybe, that uh, we got from the registrant uh, correspondents, our participants who join us. You know, we had we gave them a registration form and uh, to let we give them an opportunity to give us ideas on what they want to have addressed during uh, this webinar on smart farming. So we have a few things. We uh, compiled a small document on that. And I'm going to use that to maybe guide our conversation today. Um, okay, so let's start. We hear a lot about smart farming. So what is smart farming really? And why is it important? How can it solve any of the challenges that say, Mr. Biketi, you, when, you, uh, when you introduced yourself, you talked about some of the challenges you experienced as a smart farmer at, at your late Katie's farm. Let us know what is smart farming um, and why is it important, especially today? Yeah, smart farming. Smart farming is just the way it is literally, smart farming, smart farming, okay? Uh, is where you engage your brains. You need to uh, provide specifically what, for instance, your crops or animal need. So you have to be smart in your way of doing things, in your way of production, such that you have to employ all the necessary resources to, uh, and facilitation to make sure that you're getting what you want with the minimum cost. That is smart farming. So you, you uh, basically in smart farming, you, we use technology because uh, technology is what has uh, 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 brought uh, efficiency uh, and uh, enhance, uh, you know, uh, uh, faster ways of uh, doing things. For instance, uh, uh, some of the problems uh, we have been in, uh, encountering in uh, traditional farming, you, your crops are dying in the field. You don't know what to do. One, you will start speculating. Maybe it could be weather problem, uh, it, it's too hot, or there's no uh, rain. So that's why your crops are drying. But then it could, that could be the case, or maybe it could be not. Maybe you are missing something, some important element in the soil. But you will know, how will you know that if you do not use a, a technology? So that's a, when our uh, smart farming comes in, you'll be able to tell everything that your crop, for instance, needs, or what it doesn't need by use of technology. For instance, the sensors we are using on my farm, uh, you, you'll be able to know, for instance, if you're missing uh, an, an important element like iron, or you are maybe soil pH is too high, that's why maybe your crops are, are drying up. So you'll be able to tell by just checking your, checking your, the software for, for, the, for the sensors that uh, I have on the farm. So I'll be specific. And uh, being specific and providing exactly what your uh, production unit needs saves a lot, saves on the cost because uh, speculating and applying everything, you'll first start by irrigating, then it will not work. You have wasted water. You'll uh, add several fertilizer and many other inputs, then you realize it doesn't work. Only to realize later that it was the soil pH which was the problem. So with the sensors, it has enhanced efficiency even on the farm operation and saves, saves a lot of time. So smart farming is basically incorporating technology and uh, you know making your work easier on the farm. That's uh, smart, smart farming. Thank you, thank you for, for those who would, were wondering what smart farming is, now, now we know. So Mr. Kiringai, you told us that you're a farmer. How do you uh, employ smart farming? And, um, would you give us an example of how exactly it has benefited you as a farmer? An example or two, maybe. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think um, other than the, before you even talk about using the technology and before you even think of uh, how that technology will yield any results to yourself. The most critical thing is to know what are the best or the right practices to employ so that you can gain from the use of that technology solution. 
Um, so if, for instance, you wanted to know the, the impact of the, the pH of the soil, you need to know what the pH is all about. What is it that you need to assess in the soil? So the most critical input in all agriculture and the knowledge that is, uh, the, the critical input ingredient that is necessary is knowledge. So the first thing that we do is, do we identify the right source of knowledge? We have a program that uh, trains our farmers, much more than being a farmer. We use our farm as a demonstration hub for those people who want to practice the activities that we do. So in our programming, we ensure that knowledge delivery is the most critical. We, see, we therefore have um, our tools for capturing knowledge and using the web or the internet for the purpose of delivery of knowledge because uh, smart farming, as uh, Piketty has said, is how do you integrate a uh, technology with uh, the practice of farming. And so the, the technology that's most critical for us, therefore, is the internet. But when you go to the farm, you would like to know where is this farm? And therefore, you need to capture the geolocation. And you also may need to know what is the soil profile of that location. Uh, he says that he is in Kajiado. Uh, if uh, you look at the ag agroecological zones of this country, you will actually be told that uh, if you are in this agroecology, these are the parameters of the climate, uh, the weather that you will find in that location, so that you are well prepared in terms of even the use of the technology itself. So we come in with a combination of technologies. We have um, the satellite infrastructure. In Gordon, we integrate the satellite data, which gives us a location profile that tells us this is what you will find in terms of the soil, in terms of the weather, in terms of the, the wind speed that you will find there, and in terms of the greenery that you expect to find there. But that is not sufficient. While the satellite will give you that information, then you need a person who can go on the ground and tell you, I have gone to Biketi's farm. It is five acres. He has the potential to do this. He can keep 500 goats or cows, and they will be able to be satisfied if you can deliver this kind of um, inputs into that locality because of the, uh, the, the level of uh, uh, resource availability that you have in that uh, area. So crop masks, we, we call them, will actually be captured. So in a nutshell, what I'm trying to say, in our case, we use a combination of um, mobile devices so that we can go to the ground and capture what information we may have from our satellite data. We also go with, uh, uh, we also go with an organizational framework, which we call a hub, and we bring farmers together around the hub so that they can undertake activities together including ourselves, we actually have set up a, a, a farm hub where people come to learn, uh, youth come to practice the use of ICT, and they, they try to, to, to deploy their innovations around that. So it, uh, I would say that um, it may be necessary sometimes to actually show people what it is that you are doing, um, rather than the, just uh, talking theoretically. So that is why we, we have a program that is more experiential in nature. And um, I'm sure here uh, in this uh, forum, we most likely have a few of our students who are participating in our learning programs that are already in participation. So I can say that um, uh, this is a smart agriculture, uh, the combination of technology with knowledge and uh, diverse technologies, including the internet of things that uh, uh, Mark so well elaborated on what Panda is doing. But the, all those technologies are not what you go picking on the basis of it is a technology it was mentioned in a webinar. It is picking the technology that applies for your locality. And that is what our practice is all about. So I would want to say that um, we try 
therefore, those concepts and perspectives that help people deploy the right technologies. And we use digital handheld skills, mobile phones or handheld devices, and the devices that uh, give us the geospatial and geotagging dimension at the localities where we go. And uh, those are the technologies at the moment that we are using. We definitely will be making more of those available on a, um, a wider scale at the national level when we have a platform uh, around which data that is stored in the cloud will actually be available to everybody for open data land and based um, data analytics, as we can say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kiringai. Uh, from what you have said, uh, um, I understand that uh, basically smart farming has benefited you in, in the way that uh, you now, you have information now. You know, you, you, you have sensors and you have information. You know about your soil, you know about the health of your crops, you know about the humidity, you know about the water supply, you know. So I think that's a very important thing as a farmer. Uh, which actually leads me to the next question. For in Kenya, most of the we've always been using the traditional methods. You know, when waiting for the rain, you know, it's long season is coming, so you plant. Uh, and climate change now, nothing is reliable. So now these traditional methods, but they've worked. Not that they haven't; they've always been working, but. Um, it's been passed down to so many generations and the, we still have people who are using them today. But uh, you, we, you want, or rather, we want to urge farmers to embrace smart farming. So now, does this mean that uh, they should depart from uh, traditional methods of farming? Miss Bernadette, could maybe help us with this because uh, the smart farmer no, no, no. I, I, do, I don't think that um, they should de depart from, uh, not necessarily, not all of it. You know, there are some things like using the hoe that uh, this is a new time. This is uh, 2020. Using the hoe should be something you put aside, maybe just for something small or your kitchen garden, eh? but not for real commercial farming. That one, no. But there, there are other aspects like... Uh, crop rotation, conservation farming, agroforestry, such things uh, are things that were gained through the ages that are still really re relevant to small scale farmers. And I, I believe they should use it. But uh, anyway, if you ask me, definitely we have to move on. Farmers have to be open. Uh, they should uh, accept change. They should ac accept to open up to new things uh, because like uh, what uh, Biketi was saying and Kirungai, uh, there are new things that are really useful for small scale farmers as well. It's not just for large scale farmers. I am a storyteller, so I like using uh, stories to tell pictures. Uh, there's a story we wrote about uh, um, IoT, which is Internet of Things, and uh, where we are saying, uh, just imagine you're a farmer and you're sitting in your sitting room, and then uh, a message comes to your phone, and it is your cow, Susie. Susie is sending you a message and telling you, I am about to go on hit. And then on the other end, another message comes, your plants are calling you and saying, we have had enough water. You know, it already cuts down on all, uh, you, 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 the struggles you have to think, oh, now I have to go and see Susie's in, in, uh, it needs a, a bull, what, you know, that kind of thing. It cuts down so much on, uh, on, on use of, um, it cuts down on time, on, on also on costs, and it saves you a lot of things. So uh, I would really urge farmers that look at the technologies that are still good. You see, like there are some water technologies, water saving technologies that were used from time immemorial, you know, like in very hot places that may not, uh, that may be really useful. There are various things like um, um, fertilizer, okay, um, what do you call it? Um, cow dung and whatever. Uh, I'm forgetting the name, but uh, manure. No, yeah, manure. Manure. Thank you. Yeah, like manure, that kind of thing. We need it for our farms, especially because of uh, soil degradation and all that. So we we don't have to leave that. But can we embrace new technologies? Because that is where we are going. 
that is what everyone is doing. Uh, and we don't want to be left behind. Very true. I think, so, I think uh, Sidi, uh, the issue of uh, traditional farming um, uh, used to be, it, it is a tradition that people, uh, some people were farmers and others were herders. So that is a reality. And the only thing that has changed is maybe we have uh, reduced the quantity of land that is available for those people who want to do farming. And uh, so those ones who also want to be like uh, the Masa is where, uh, where Piketty has his farm. Um, they will actually uh, not, not, not uh, feel very comfortable to see pieces of land being used other than in handing. And the more important thing for us to realize is it is not possible to tell one person who has a very small piece of land to say that uh, there is this approach uh, that is being uh, promoted that you do in a very small piece of land. What is critical is for that person to be told that uh, there is this technology, but it has this limitation in terms of you can't deploy it on a small piece of land. I know Mark uh, deploys um, drones. If you want to deploy a drone in a quarter an acre, which is what uh, the people who buy uh, some uh, agricultural pieces of land these days and uh, they advertise in the radio, and you want to use that one, it really isn't going to work for you. What you need to do is, can you get multiple uh, numbers of people coming together, piecing their land together so that you can deploy the new technology that we are talking about? Smart agriculture will actually call for aggregation of land, not everybody having some piece of land, small one, and then thinking that they can use uh, smart technology on it. It won't work. So that is where we are seeing that the knowledge dimension has to be clear that for this to happen, it cannot be planned by an individual alone. You may have to en engage at the county level, your ward representative, uh, the farmers in a cooperative, and then you agree in what uh, they call, say, uh, one village, one crop. And then uh, you are using that uh, crop as the basis of what uh, you are using the purpose of uh, deploying technology. So I would say that, um, yes, traditionally, that is uh, interesting to actually think about technology. But let us also think about uh, the economies that uh, help us to deploy technology in a way that can make sense. You, if, even if you ask uh, uh, Simiu, he will, uh, Biket, he will not tell you that uh, he's doing his, uh, his aquaponics on a quarter of an acre he most likely tell you of a number of acres. So in a sense, I want those people who are participating here to know that there, are, there is so much. And agriculture, uh, 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 smart farming is now not uh, just uh, uh, reduced to the um, production layer alone. You can actually practice it smartly all across the chain from uh, the producer to the consumer. And that is now where the space of those who are leaving, leaving us with questions on how can a youth play a role in this smart agriculture. Look at the change, don't look at the farm alone. Look at the multiplicity of technologies that can be applied from the producer, the technologies that we are talking about being smart at the producer level, all the way with the logistics and tracking to the consumer and the selection of the nutrition that a consumer needs, that also requires to be smart as well. Thank you. Yes, uh, maybe I should just also try to uh, uh, talk about uh, the smart farming. I don't know how people really understand this because uh, it doesn't have to be, uh, smart farming doesn't have to be large scale and uh, with a hefty capital investment requirement. Smart farming is uh, just how, 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 how do you want to, uh, to achieve your goals? You first of all outline your goals and what do you want how do you want to achieve them what, what are the means what means do you want to use so uh this should be able to answer your question uh, uh if you want to switch from a conventional farming system which is the traditional way of farming or you want to do smart farming we are not really forcing people to embrace smart farming 
but necessity should give you the way because if you you have to know the specific uh, environmental requirement for your crops and animals in your field then how else will you do it without technology do you want to go and employ uh, an individual for every uh, production unit to be monitoring uh, the temperature to dip the stick i don't know put their hand inside and try to know whether the temperature is well enough for the fish do you want to to put four people on a 10 acre farm to dig do you want to be moving around yourself and checking crop by crop to see whether they're infested with the uh, pests or they're lacking any specific uh, uh, nutrition requirement this now when we say uh, necessity will will answer this question because if you want to make your work faster and easier and achieve your goals faster, then you'll have to, to go an extra mile because uh, the market is waiting. The market for agriculture is also seasonal. We know very well that uh, agriculture is seasonal. So to beat seasonality, you need to be smart in your working. Otherwise, the market will come and go as you are still fighting on the farm with pests and uh, moving around. So technology should be... Uh, it, it's a... Uh, should be embraced, you, you should embrace it based on what you want to achieve and how you want to achieve. It's all about efficiency in your production systems. Just to add on that, uh, uh, smart farming also involves the use of things such as mobile phones and uh, on, online uh, where you can search for markets. Like uh, right now during this COVID period, farmers are really using um, the online uh, and Facebook and WhatsApp to look for markets. And I think they're really doing well. Uh, it's no longer an issue of just standing outside and wondering where can I get market, but now um, organized farmers, a smart farmer is a farmer who will plan from the beginning where the market is and, and then also use these technologies to find where the market is. Uh, a smart farmer is somebody who will use the phone to find out what is the weather, uh, what is happening out there, what are the weathermen saying, uh, and, and they'll get that information from, all this information now is, online and and it's very easy so that's part of it and for the sake of uh, when i mentioned about uh, crop farming and i mentioned the, that uh, it is uh, it is better when you are deploying some technologies like drones and uh, there you have to think about uh, bigger pieces of land because i see a question that is being thrust at me um, in, in terms of the sizes and what I can say is this, if you want to monitor the performance of uh, the space where you are planting your sukuma wiki and to know whether they have uh, su sufficient water available to them, then you need just a sensor. And a sensor uh, doesn't require to uh, deploy a drone. You can actually use that as the appropriate technology there. If I, for instance, like a dairy goat farmer, and I produce, um, I produce on a daily basis, I produce around 100 kgs of dairy goat milk. Now, and, if, and I supply it to Nairobi, and there is a processor in Nairobi who actually says that uh, they will uh, buy my milk, and they buy my milk. When COVID came, and uh, the places where they deliver the milk closed, what happened? They gave me, uh, a warning, we have closed until further notice. Now, what technology is right for, the, for me to actually bounce so that my, I don't tell my, my goats, I will not milk you until further notice because the goat will produce the milk whether or not there is a market. So you have to make sure that you deploy now the technology that is right for the market that you want to target. So what I did is link up immediately with the uh, Grovo. And I requested them, can you give me uh, to, to supply milk to individuals? And now individuals now are directed through their, 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 their web link that there is this supplier of goat milk that is available. Do you want milk? And then people will place their orders on the basis of an existing system or infrastructure. I'll be able to deliver milk through the, gro the global in infrastructure to individuals. But I have to use the mobile phone. I have to use the pay bill number for people to pay me. 
I have to use uh, the location of mapping so that I can track where my, my consumers are and to be in a position to direct whoever is delivering to them where they are. So the GPS becomes important and the satellite becomes important. So what I'm trying to say is there is the choice of appropriateness of the technology that you want to deploy that will also guide which smart agricultural technology do I want to deploy in what I'm doing. And what Mark will actually uh, um, recommend to his uh, plantation farmers in the flower industry in Naivasha. And the, the, the technology that I will deploy with my farmers uh, who, are, who have the goods in my village, it will all be very different because we are uh, addressing diverse uh, uh, geological uh, challenges and the value chain are also different. Thank you. Okay, okay. So I think we've even addressed the next few questions which were on the t in scale of uh, the land. If I do I need a big land to do this uh, in, in terms of what technologies to apply. So now I want us to maybe look at it from the government side. Ms. Mbaka, we mentioned about you know government projects on uh, food security and all that I understand the we have a couple of maybe irrigation irrigation schemes happening all over the country do they adopt uh, the use of technology and how are they using this and um, yeah what's their approach on uh, boosting farming with the uh, adoption of technology uh, thank you so much Selby um, well, um, first of all, I'd like to say I'm encouraged by the use of technology in farming on the ground on the whole value chain from production where you can have, you can monitor the tasks on the ground that you're on your farm all the way to, you know, selling your products as uh, Madame Bernadette has stated, using social media even, you know, to reach your market. So I'm very encouraged by that. And, um, as I stated, as I stated earlier, you know, the government encourages the harnessing of uh, technology to achieve our development goals. And of course, one of the main priorities under the big four agenda, actually one of the big four is food security. Um, so which the goal um, itself is to ensure that all citizens enjoy food security and improved nutrition by 2022. And if you look at, in our documents, including the Vision 2030, ICT plays a catalytic role in achieving all these development goals. Um, so the, the government has come in really in, uh, in this way by enabling, uh, creating an enabling environment for the uptake and for the use of ICTs in all, you know, all aspects of the economy. And um, they've we've done this by having a, a robust legal and policy framework in place, as well as an in infrastructural um, infrastructural framework so as to ensure connectivity across the whole country. So perhaps I could uh, talk a bit about that. Uh, under the legal frameworks, of course, uh, the policy side, we have the national ICT policy, which uh, sets out the standards to guide the sector and ensure quality and compatibility of digital devices to facilitate uptake and application of ICTs by businesses and all citizens. We also have, uh, under legal instruments, we have the Computer and Cyber Crimes Act, which uh, deals with incidents of abuse and misuse of digital devices to protect users online. We also have the Data, Data Protection Act in place, which protects the privacy and confidentiality of citizens' data. On the infrastructural front, we, we have the, the program, the National Optic Fiber Backbone Infrastructure, which uh, the government has actually laid down over 6,000 kilometers of this uh, fiber backbone infrastructure across the, the country. And as I speak, all county headquarters of the national and county government are connected to broadband to facilitate access of e-government services. So that is from the Ministry of ICT side. So perhaps next time, uh, as we'll have a series of this, we can, we can be joined by my counterpart in the Ministry of Agriculture to give you more on what's actually happening on the ground because I'm, I'm aware that there is actually use of ICT in, um, in agricultural programs around the world. 
and I mean around the country at this at this time. Maybe I can Thank back. You. Maybe I can back uh, Madam Baka with uh, some knowledge around the, the Ministry of Agriculture. I happen to yes, see yes. for a bit very closely so, uh, of course. Like in the Ministry of Agriculture. And one of the things that is happening within the Ministry of Agriculture with God and support is that we are, uh, we are establishing what are called food hubs, uh, or farm hubs rather, at uh, the producer level. Um, and it will actually be very exciting if we can actually combine what they do with the, in the Ministry of ICT and what we are doing with the farm hubs. Because at the county level, at the constituency level, the Ministry of ICT has um, this, um, uh, she, she knows what they call it now, uh, at every con con constituency level, you have four of them. The constituency innovation hubs. The, the constituency innovation hubs and we have the farm hubs the idea is can we deploy our youth to be the extension workers you noticed in the in the recent um, uh, what was it called the the paper that uh, the president uh, did uh, a few weeks ago where he consolidated a number of uh, actions within the ministries and he did return agricultural extension service and agricultural training centers to the Ministry of Agriculture headquarters. What had happened with the constitution is that we had separated um, extension and research and knowledge um, training that is, uh, which were being handled by the ministry, by, by the uh, ministry headquarters and extension and farmer training to be at the, at, at the county. And that created a lot of havoc because now the knowledge could not be delivered when the ministries, ministry and the counties don't agree. And uh, for a long part, part of uh, the initial years of, the, of our implementation of the constitution, that was not ag addressed because of uh, some uh, confusion that was created by an article called Sage you for the constitution. Now, what has happened is that with this new change that has come, it is now possible for us to actually work together um, to create one framework for knowledge delivery and use young people to act as the advisory or so the extension. From universities, what we are creating what is called uh, the, well, of course it's Gordon that is spearheading this, uh, we are creating Gordon data centers within the university, digital centers within the universities. And who will go to collect the data? It is these smart technologies that we are talking about here being deployed at the hubs that ICT has or the farm hubs that we are talking about. And then they will go to the ground to do the geotagging uh, backed by the satellite infrastructure that Gordon is actually creating for Kenya, a Gordon data cube, that we can now work together using the, the, the data cube for agriculture and the farmers using the youths from their own locations and then we can have data collected and can be used now for the analytics, can actually now be used by the Ministry of uh, ICT because they are the ones who do the analytics. The Ministry of Agriculture is only interested in the evidence, but the use cases of the data can only be done by the people who understand the analytics dimension. And that is now where the Ministry of ICT comes in. So we are advocating and we actually have started discussing within Africa the creation of a national agricultural open data councils and i will be looking for uh, madam baka for this because um, it will be interesting to see what we can do to address what upande has actually started by addressing smart agriculture thank you okay thank you thank you very much that was uh, that was actually quite interesting you know most of us did not know about this uh, constituency hubs and uh, farm hubs around us, you know, a lot might be going on uh, in our backyard and we do not know. So it's actually very good to have you guys here and tell us more about it. So now, when it comes to technology, yeah, you know, everyone, we all assume that uh, it's costly, it's expensive. How do you, how, how do we, you know, how can we help this and how is it that expensive? Do we have low cost solutions? And uh, say I have a small farm, I, I have maybe like a small piece of farm, maybe, maybe even an acre or less, 
in uh, just around Nairobi. I want to maybe start growing my garlic and uh, I want to do it smartly. So, but I'm concerned about the technology cost. So, um, how do I go about that, Miss Bernadette? How can you help me? You're, you're muted. Muted, sorry. I'm saying, can you guys help there? Okay. <laughs> or Thank, you. The answers. Thank you very much. Yes, um, there are technologies that are right for different locations. In urban areas, we have urban agriculture. And that is where we even use uh, sacks to become the, the farm. Not just a, a, a quarter of an acre. You can use a, a sack and you can plant all the greeneries that you need for the house. Um, then you go to the rural areas. And if you now told a small village farmer to pay uh, for the platform that Mark is providing in his ERP and pay 5,000 shillings, and they only own a goat that produces milk that is only 1,000 shillings that they earn in a month, uh, you will kill them. But this now brings us to where we are saying, uh, Madam Baka has actually brought us a very exciting dimension. Those hubs that they are creating and the farm hubs that we are creating, if we were to combine this in a county, because that is where the fiber has reached. And then we invite Mark and we agree, can you deploy your ERP here? And we have 5,000 farmers in this county. And all these farmers, 5,000 of them, will be sharing your $50. 5,000 farmers sharing $50 will be so minimal that they will all be able to actually afford the license quest and the, the cost that uh, Mark is actually asking us to provide. So for that matter, within the agricultural dimension and within what uh, the Ministry of Agriculture has created that is called Agricultural uh, Sector Transformation and Growth Strategy, ASTGS, we actually have uh, come in with the request that can we make sure that we have well-defined value chain engagements where we are having producers organized and consumers organized. But no one is actually coming up with a model, which is why, because Gordon advises the government, we actually created now this council so that we can have now the, the role of the consumers being defined very clearly and their nutritional requirements and our nutrition dimension helps us to address that. Then we are also going to the producers and organizing the farmers at the county level and creating the farm hubs. So we have farm hubs and we have food hubs and we, we want to, to be able to link these two. So in a nutshell, what we are saying is cost is only a deterrent when you think you are acting alone. When you think of operating together, and I want to say this, if I get every farmer, the consumers in Nairobi to buy from them, and the, the system of linking them is so clear, then the amount of money that will be available to the farmer will be more, and the cost requirement will be much less than, or will not be felt at all. So we can actually address that. And that, those are the dimensions that our open data dimension is actually trying to, to address by helping. Can we therefore now start looking at how do we make this infrastructure work for our country so that we can create an, a number of enterprises that uh, where the money moves from the consumer uh, to, the, to the producer in a way that makes the consumer feel that the, the account, the, the activity they are doing is noble. And that is what we want, we would like to do. I hope I have been able to uh, help uh, Bernadette enough. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. I think even uh, sensors like uh, for IoT are going to become cheaper with the uh, with, uh, Sigfox and uh, Liquid uh, Telecom coming together to 
to introduce them around the country. I think that was something going on and I'm hoping it's still going on because it's going to make them much cheaper so that uh, farmers are able to have these sensors on their farm as, uh, as cheap as possible. So there are very many other small ways, like for example, on the, are you talking, your phone is off. So the, the, like, like for getting information, getting information is part of the technologies, smart technologies, and you can get it from your phone. Uh, as long as you have a smartphone, you can get markets from your phone as long as you have a smartphone. So it, it's all for, it's for small scale farmers as well as large scale farmers. So it's still possible. Yeah, maybe I can also just uh, chip in from the Upanda side and, uh, and I can really resonate with, with all of the previous comments that have been made about yeah, partnerships and seeing how different ministries can come together and on these hubs we can actually uh, pair, uh, pair up and see how we can bring the cost down because indeed uh, open data has been mentioned. These are data sources that are in principle freely available as Ubanda, we're also actually deploying a lot of open source technology. That means that uh, there are not a lot of costs involved with the license. So if we can actually uh, afford it and set it up on, on affordable hardware, which can be shared, these costs are only going to be able to go down. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, Ms. Muger also mentioned uh, the cost of IoT also coming down. Fox in the There's more and more connectivity uh, uh, becoming available also for other frequencies uh, that where sensors can ride on and and actually as Upanda we are developing also hardware ourselves so you have to imagine that also when you import hardware uh, whether it's for Sigfox or for other networks that we also deploy in areas where they don't have coverage uh, in essence we can deploy them anywhere we're not dependent we don't have to wait for Sigfox to come in we can actually set up private networks already uh, using some uh, some open frequencies for communication um, of course, bringing in hardware still comes at a cost uh, if, if there are small orders um, and, uh, and that is, can be prohibitive sometimes. Uh, at the same time, from our office here in Nairobi, we're actually developing hardware uh, with embedded software that will uh, allow us to build even cheaper um, electronics, sensors, IoT devices in the country. We're not going to be dependent in the future of uh, waiting for things to uh, come from from uh, resellers in Europe, uh, or even from uh, you know devices that we design here and and build in China, they will actually also be built here. And I think uh, there are some exciting things you know coming in the pipeline that will allow us to actually make uh, IoT devices here for for a few thousand shillings each, basically. So basically, IoT devices are increasingly becoming a, a commodity, and that means that. Uh, you know, it's going to start becoming within reach for more and more people. So actually um, making use of the data that they can provide and uh, helping you make intelligent decisions on a daily basis uh, that are just going to make your operations, you know, more, uh, more productive is basically what we're talking about, making sense of the information that is going to become av available because of, of commoditization of, of also hardware that's actually happening uh, as we speak. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's good news, Mark. Thanks. And, and what, what is actually emerging, uh, Sabi, is when you now uh, bring in some technological thinkers who are smart thinkers like Mark and his company, and you bring in the infrastructure that the Ministry of ICT and uh, the um, organizational framework the Ministry of Agriculture can bring in, then the thing that you then find is if now us as farmers can group together so that we find we provide the ministry of agriculture with the evidence they need so that they can say the government can even invest in so much in agriculture when we are organized even the dimension of investment in agriculture becomes clear when we are organized even the way the ministry of ict relates to open, I mean, big data sourcing becomes a clear story. And for those who are now in academia, when they now want to go and interrogate data and do data analytics, the repository where that data is sitting is clearly identifiable. So in a nutshell, what we are saying, what we have lacked before are those people who are doing the things we are doing here, 
coming and talking and telling those other stakeholders at policy institutions, development, and even the government to actually embrace collaboration so that we are all working together towards a common good. And I think the starting point is not to say that uh, the government does in reason like everybody tells the government. We, you only need to come together so that you can import what uh, Mark knows where we can source the material that he needs for his uh, innovation. And if there is something that uh, COVID-19 has brought that is very exciting for everyone, it is for countries and professionals in those countries to know that you do not have to go import technology from China. You can import the raw materials of technology and do every thinking and fabrication of the same in your own country and create the right framework to achieve what every country can be able to achieve. And I think that is what is smart and it is what we are discussing. Yeah, and also maybe I'll just want to echo what uh, you, have all been, you have all mentioned. Um, when you talk about smart farming, uh, now I'll talk from a farmer perspective. It, uh, it doesn't have to be about importing uh, all this, the, I mean, installing uh, all this machinery and uh, hard technologies on your farm. Don't look at it that way. First of all, as a farmer, you are a business person and an agribusiness person. You, for every business, you need to uh, evaluate your market. First of all, find your market and know what your market wants. Once you have market for your, for your product, uh, you will not go wrong with even the kind of uh, technology you will employ on your farm. It will pay. And about the cost uh, of uh, this technology and the cost of smart farming, that will be covered if only you make the right decision as a farmer. Because uh, what will be the point of uh, you starting uh, venturing into agribusiness without a market, without a properly defined market? That's when you'll, you'll have uh, an increased, uh, I mean, a high cost of production because you'll deploy technology and all those sort of things. Then at the end, you have no market for your product. But if you have sat down and done your math well, you have a proper market, Eventually, it doesn't matter the, um, uh, the cost of input and technology and uh, the smart farm you are, you are going to put in place because once you have the market, it will pay. Like, that's exactly what is happening. For me, I have, uh, I'm using sensors from Popande uh, and it's, it has really helped me, especially this time of uh, COVID-19. On my farm, no single person has gone for a break uh, because of uh, COVID. We are the way, we, we, are the way we, we have been and that's how we are always going to be. We are not many, we are just a handful on about an uh, eight-acre farmland. We just have a few people. But with technology, we are able to effectively manage and run all the operations of the farm and maximize on our, our output. And we are not complaining about uh, the cost because we are able to cover it. Because being a smart farmer, we sat down and made the right decisions. And we are now employing the right tools to drive us towards uh, the success of the farm. Yeah, maybe if I can just also quickly uh, add on to that. Um, I think what's also increasingly becoming possible is that when a farmer is having their records digitized uh, in, in, for example, an ERP like ours or, or anybody else's for that matter, increasingly this kind of information now can also be linked to the market directly itself. So, of course, one of the things that, you know, is, is tricky in Kenya is that a lot of farmers are producing for middlemen and the middlemen, they sell to other middlemen and, and uh, all of the time now costs are being added and in the end the farmer gets, uh, you know, a, a poor price for their product. But when you start embracing technology uh, and you have a good product, um, then you can actually start advertising that product through your platform as well and potentially sell to anybody who's willing to come and, uh, and, and, or, and pick it up at, at the right price. Right, so um, it's also empowering in that sense, and, the, and it's basically just a click in a system. But when it comes to policy thinking, and I know Madam Baka will actually be there to listen to this, what the government loves is not dealing with individuals. It loves dealing with what, from my point, when, when I teach, I tell people that uh, it is critical to ensure that you have a structure. So ensure that we are relying on a structured framework, dealing with middlemen across the board who know uh, we promote what, uh, what we call uh, information asymmetry along the chain. Then once you have the structure in place, 
it is possible for you to map in a strategy, a strategic dimension of how you engage within uh, these actors. It is then, once you have a strategy that is guided by what uh, Biketi is saying, that you will identify your market and you know your production. You are able to tell what is happening in between because now that is where Mark is saying that intermediaries or the middlemen play. If you have a system that is driven by the consumer wants quantity Y and uh, the producer has a production quantity A, then it is possible for you to link that through a system. So system becomes the other critical ingredient that you must be interested in looking at. But there is one element that um, Biketi may actually ignore because he talks about a handful of workers, his knowledgeable staff. Staffing, when you are talking about smallholder farmers in rural areas, uh, who majority of them even never went to school, if you tell them to even do any arithmetic, you are insulting them. So you require, therefore, to have the right staffing that will actually know how to relate with the producers who even never went to school. So the staffing is what we, we, we call extension in the ag agricultural paradigm. And because it had died, but we have students and youth who are not working, then it is possible to actually now use the structures that the Ministry of ICT and the Ministry of Agriculture are calling hubs to actually bring these people together so that they can offer this. And it is at that point where you can now deploy your IoT and the related knowledge infrastructure that can be discussed. Then it is at that point that you now can say that you have been able to realize a solution. In a nutshell, I call them in my class, I call them the five S's. They are very critical. You can't live without them, but you need to get the buy-in of all the partners, of all the stakeholders, and everybody who is here uh, participating needs to be a stakeholder in what we are talking about in the smart, uh, uh, smart farming dimension. Okay, that was uh, quite informative and intense, but I like that. So now, one, one, one question that came up uh, with me and my farm, my garlic farm around Nairobi. So now when uh, I have my farm, you know, it's, it's a small farm, maybe in the middle of, uh, you know, farms around, you know, so these hubs, uh, are they, uh, do they bring together farms that are, you know, separate, you know, they can, can they be like far from each other or is it more like, a, say, like one acre farm where they get people who have farms and then they just uh, put, they decide, let's join our lands together and we occupy, say, like a section of the land and then we farm in the whole area together or now can the hub be deployed or rather can the hub be useful when it comes to distant pieces of land, you know, I have small, a small piece of land here. Can I join that hub of yours? I don't have a big piece of land, it's just a small one. And uh, can I also get the advantages uh, the, the privileges that come with that, the IOTs and that when I have, uh, I don't have that big of a use case. Mr. Kiringai, are you talking on that? Sorry? Sorry, the was... hubs, yeah? Yes, I was responding to somebody here who is asking me questions. Okay, uh, they, they someone else can uh, help me, or maybe they are distracting Baka me. can okay. help me on the hubs and how they work, uh, even in terms of deployment of uh, finances. And is it um, do they also provide? Well, the cost of farming is quite high, even without uh, the in, in involving technology in it as we speak. So does this make it better, even for me with uh, my small farm in Nairobi? You know, it's not outside where there are lots of farms and people. So can that work for me as a small farmer? I, I think, I think um, uh, in, 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 the, in the geographical area mm -hmm. that can be able to pull consumers together, I, I, will, I would imagine 
for a person sitting in Nairobi, uh, their production goes even in the farm. They don't even look for any, any consumer. Their neighbors know that they produce uh, this commodity. So I know of a lady who produces honey in Rhodesia. And um, she, before she can even harvest, the orders for the honey she produces is late. And she doesn't sell it at the price that they sell in uh, the supermarket. She sells it for more. Why? Because everybody is sure that this is organic honey. It is being provided by somebody we know. And I don't have to really order it at some particular point in time. They will be able to do that. The places where you actually need the hobby is now. If you take, for instance, let's take the worst case scenario and you take a place like Kibera and say, what do they consume? If, you, if they consume, say, if you consider they, they are consuming uh, potatoes, where are the potatoes going to come from? They most likely come from uh, a few farmers in Kinagop, a few farmers from Muranga, and a few farmers from uh, Bomet, and a few farmers from uh, Narok. Now, in order to aggregate those so that they can meet the order of the consumers or the consumption in Kibera, then there has to be a hub where everything comes and then local people there can now ag aggregate the orders. And that is now where we are saying that the youth in Nairobi can actually be deployed as the resource to go and identify this order came from house A. This other one came from South house, uh, 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 place B. So when you actually think about all that, um, you can, you can uh, see the possibility of the uh, orders being aggregated and they provide the, um, they provide the orders that, that, they provide the aggregated order that will be met by multiple hubs in the producer or the farm hub. So, and then similarly, dif different commodities will, will similarly be bought. And now this at the moment has been a concept that Gordon has come up with and we are test testing it in Kenya because of course um, I drive African agenda and uh, I'm the one who is actually driving the implementation of the farm hub dimension and food hub dimension. So we will actually be testing it here. Once it is done that, if we have already developed the system that can be rolled out in Africa, and because we have the continental free trade area, one of the things that should happen is we will be able now to deploy uh, that system on a cloud that Mrs. Baka can actually now host uh, in her huge servers in the ministry. And then we can now create our youths as service providers that are going to offer services in other countries. And we will not have joblessness in our country. So when you actually think about um, the farm hubs, maybe a construct that is now talking about Kibera, but it will be the same one. And I see we have some participants who are in the Netherlands. They will most likely have the, the in, be interested in our avocado or macadamia. We will actually be able to aggregate our macadamia at the same hubs that are existing in the same uh, ecological zones where the, the macadamia and, and, and avocado are grown. So the technologies of now perfecting or making efficient the value chain becomes much, much more clearer when we have already created the structure that we want to drive. But I want to leave the, 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 the next comment to Madam Baka. Um, Selby, thank you. I think what I, I wanted to add on to what Mr. Kiringai has stated was really to, to clarify or to clarify what constituency innovation hubs are and what is on the ground at the moment. So this, the CIHs, we call them CIHs, it's a program under the ministry. Um, through the government, the ministry collaborates with the members of parliaments in the constituencies. So these are actually innovation hubs. They are te technology centers, which the government, in partnership with MPs, set up and, and is aiming to set up in all 290 constituencies. So at the moment, there are over 150 such centers uh, set up and operational. So these are centers where um, there's, it's installed with free broadband connectivity and equipped with digital devices to enable members of the community 
to access online platforms for information on uh, agribusiness, market trends, uh, technology, innovation, among others. So the centers will give equal opportunities to young people in rural and urban environments to access opportunities through the internet at these centers. So that's what the CIHs actually are, and uh, that's what they're doing at the moment. And in connection to the CIHs, the government also has in place the Ajira Digital Program, which is a program that seeks to see, to have the youth earning from digital and digitally enabled jobs. So actually through the provi provision of this uh, free internet access um, and devices at the CIHs, we have the youth in uh, various places going to these uh, hubs. Well, this was actually before, of course, before the pandemic, they would visit the hubs and have access to the internet to work online, actually gain, actually earn a living off working, uh, you know, on online jobs through maybe content creation, uh, selling their wares online and such. So that's what is actually happening at the CIHs and, uh, through the Ajira Digital Program. And at the hub, at the farm hubs, what we are having um, is uh, just uh, similar to what uh, Madam Baka have, uh, have in their CIHs, but uh, we have uh, the internet provision and we also have uh, trainers and we have now the extension workers as I have indicated. And um, all that happens is that then we have training that is a geared to train farmers who are in groups so that they can understand what it is that they can deliver to this hub. So uh, while the, uh, the, the infrastructure that is being set by the constituency is very, uh, the innovation hubs in, in the constituency is so much important because we do not have to create anything extra. It is only bringing a service and the service will be brought by, we have partnered with universities local or even uh, those ones that are in Nairobi, like the University of Nairobi. I mean the University of Nairobi, so I like giving the University of Nairobi as an example. So our students go for attachment, now not in farms, but go to attachment in uh, these hubs. And we'd actually want now to have a structured engagement so that uh, when it comes to agriculture or even innovation or value chain engagement, we are using uh, students that are local to that locality so that even the cost to the parents when they are students i mean when their children go for attachment they don't have to go to i mean they don't have to pay accommodation and transport and all that are, those are the costs that go with the um, remote uh, teaching so we can actually now uh, have these hubs being the ones that will anchor the human resource for you and for their uh, college going students and that will also uh, spur other levels of innovation that we don't have at the moment. Okay, great. Thank you so much. That uh, was very informative, just shedding a light on uh, the hubs and how they work. So now uh, we mentioned about uh, the pandemic. Yeah. And lately also farmers have suffered a lot of uh, natural attacks, you know, from floods to locusts, and now we have uh, the COVID-19. Are there any opportunities that uh, that have brought up, that have come up with the pan pandemic, or any lessons that we have learned as, a, you know, as a smart farmer, or uh, basically as a farmer? This is an open question, so feel free to maybe chip in if you've learned anything as a farmer during this uh, time or if you've uh, basically made think, um, the, far, the farmer who has given i, I gave my example mm -hmm. of uh, my daily good and grover and how we are using the the safari con mobile and uh, numbers the till number and uh, i i recently received because um um I, I i bank with the cooperative bank i also discovered that they actually have discovered the strength of this uh, innovation that is called the two number um so now that you can actually use a, a a similar dimension so to start with those are opportunities that corporates have identified Grovo has identified because of delivery to individuals in their homes and they have always been doing that but they were doing it only for foods now they are doing it for agriculture for the agricultural value chain. Much more so, 
uh, if you if, if you remember i said that i was uh, supplying my milk to a processor that is based here in nairobi that processes milk and now when they told me uh, until further notice i had to now uh, get people who can uh, consume my milk so now i have uh, households that uh, now have identified with the taking of uh, my raw milk from the goats and uh, for your information goat milk is the most nutritious milk not because i'm producing it that is the reason i actually went to produce it and um, now because and of course mark will say the same about uh, fish and aquaculture um but uh, when you actually think about uh, the things that we all are doing and using technology around that when somebody delivers their their produce the critical element that you need is a digital device for weighing and Mark can tell you that that is uh, the trademark. I'm the one who automates every agricultural activity across the board, uh, from tea to coffee to dairy, everything that uh, goes digital is one of my companies that actually does the automation of that one uh, across East Africa. So when we, I'm not just a, a, a teaching uh, person, I also practice the things I teach. So. One of the things that uh, I can say with uh, emphasis is that we are having a now a localization of technologies. It's only unfortunate that uh, when you have a, a government hubs, like we, 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 if you are operating at the county and they have to, to be very strict in what the government has said, we are not allowed to uh, social distance within a learning facility where people can use ICT. They have to be closed. But we did not close because of COVID. We closed because of the rules that we have uh, created around COVID. But our innovations, people who are doing uh, social innovations, people who are doing uh, technological innovations, they can still continue with this. And we are, we are finding, uh, I personally has found that I am busier now with uh, the work I'm doing, addressing challenges associated with um, with, 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 with COVID. Uh, with, I mean, like, like now talking, I'm talking here. I'm very busy doing that. Uh, I will most likely tomorrow, there is another one called by the Ministry of uh, I, uh, Agriculture and they are talking about the, uh, the, the food security and I will actually, actually be there. When you actually look at uh, the, the day being full, it is much fuller now than it was before because there is no time that is getting to waste. And on the side of delivery of foods, it is one of the critical uh, services that you can address in the country. No one has closed uh, or put roadblocks against suppliers of food. I use my pass from my company to actually cross the road barriers because I have created it and it is one of the things that was gazetted. So you have instruments within the government that allow food producers to move from one area to another. So food is not restricted by COVID. So I can say with certainty that for all the producers who are within an organized system that can speak on their behalf, the government has actually allowed this not to be affected by the curfew, not to be affected by the, uh, the COVID rules. And I think uh, that I, I have found to be the most interesting thing around this time. So instead of reducing the business, as uh, Biketi has, has mentioned, it has actually increased it. I think uh, the pandemic has also, you've mentioned it, let me just emphasize it, that uh, agriculture and farmers are now being recognized as a serious uh, sector because uh, they, they are essential. Food has to be eaten. Without food, we cannot survive. So agriculture is being recognized. And this, uh, uh, even the government now is having meetings, a lot of meetings with the private sector dealing with agriculture, uh, as opposed to before, you know. So that is something uh, very positive in the sector. Uh, COVID is also bringing a lot of introspection. People are looking inward. Uh, instead of thinking about uh, what we have to bring from other countries, what can we do here? How can we add value to what we have here? Instead of sending our produce all the way, all the time, and, and what can we do? What can we add value? And, um, and, and 
to, to, to boost our farmers, what can we do? Also, another thing that uh, the pandemic is doing is that uh, it is now making farmers, the ones who never really realized the importance of uh, digital technology or the internet and all that, they are now beginning to realize this is a tool that we can use because that is where technology is going. That is where farming is going. That's where the world is going. We have to use technology. And the pandemic, because of forcing us into quarantine, has forced many people to, to start looking at the technologies. Yep. Wow, OK. Uh, thank you so much. And I can see that time is not on our side, but we have actually answered every single question, concern that was raised by uh, our participants beforehand. And uh, I, I like that. I like, um, but one last question, maybe this could go to Mark. Yeah. When it comes to data, you know, we have the sensors, we have uh, you get your soil, soil moisture data, you have your temperature, humidity. How do you store this data? Who stores this data? Is it with you or with the, the farmer? Or, and, and also, can they uh, get the data, say, even a backlog of it? Or how does that work in terms of data from the sensors and all that? Thank you very much, uh, Selby. So basically, um, how the technology works is that the sensor uh, broadcasts its data through radio to a gateway that is placed, for example, at the farm. Um, and from there, that gateway is connected to the internet, which means that that data gets sent to our server, from which now uh, people through the account are able to download this data, receive it as SMS in WhatsApp, so on the one hand, that's the current data. At the same time, of course, people will sometimes want to see their historic data. They want to maybe see, you know, what is the, the, the maximum and minimum temperature during the last month, uh, you know, just so that I understand uh, okay, what I'm dealing with. So that data is also accessible through the same interface. So you can change the, the period at which you want to look at the data. And all of this data can be downloaded from there too into spreadsheet formats so that also it could be used in uh, other tools for analysis or you know modeling and things like that so in the end the data is, is accessible and fully uh, in full for for users themselves um, and uh, yeah one of the things that i think also was alluded before is is the scale at which to apply this so mr kiringai also mentioned the example of drones a drone on a on a small, let's say, a quarter acre uh, farm, you know, is not going to make economic sense. With when it comes to IoT, uh, you know, at the moment there are still also economies of scale that uh, make it, you know, become uh, attractive. So if everybody has their own gateway, for example, uh, then the cost uh, is is higher. But if, for example, farmers are able to get, come together, perhaps also through the hubs that have been mentioned that serve the region, uh, there's opportunities to actually. Uh, collaboratively also uh, apply some of this technology and then share some resources like the gateway so that the radio um, connections can still send in individual data but that there can be some shared infrastructural costs which makes it also economically uh, come down and um, I think I, I think uh, what Mark has added up with is very important when you have the hub uh, you think about uh, the farmer cooperative as uh, the hub and farmers come together and they aggregate their produce together. The data to that extent will be stored there because it is that data that will be used to pay them. Then once that has been achieved, once you have uh, the data of all the farmers and it is that that you are using to pay them, then the, the, the point of storage of that data is the complete data set that has all the details about everyone is at that local level. What we do within the global open data dimension, when you say you are opening up data sets, all, all you do is you remove all the elements that make that data personal to a person so that it is now not data about a person, it is about a process. Data associated with a process 
or what we call anonymized data can now be aggregated at the county level and at the national level and at any other level, which is now used from an economic measurement dimension. So in a sense, what we are trying to say is that we are talking of sourcing big data at the actions where activities happen, but then it is anonymized around a particular given parameter, say a person, a household, or an individual. And then you can anonymize it for a sharing that is open. Open data can be stored anywhere. And that is now where we are seeing that the collaboration with the Ministry of ICT and the Ministry of Agriculture and all those others, like those ones of water and environment that are, have the, their parameters being measured through um, the smartness of uh, technologies. We can actually now discuss what to do with our data. And that is now where the data cube becomes important and we actually are keen to discuss that further. Okay, great. So I believe we have actually addressed uh, a lot of uh, our participants' questions, even those that are coming in on the, on the Q&A feature. Most of the people are concerned about, you know, their sizes, uh, the size of the farm. Can, does it apply to them being a small scale farmer? And we have answered all that, you know, the hubs and the technology, we have answered all that. So um, this was supposed to be a Q&A session, but I believe we have actually answered the questions. I met uh, we have one of the participants who has, uh, has a, maybe a physical question. They can raise their hand and we'll give them an opportunity to speak and ask their question. But uh, I believe what we have is uh, addressed. I mean, uh, I mean, the panelists, you can also see these questions. So I think one of the questions perhaps that would be interesting to, um, to get uh, perhaps uh, maybe, maybe Bernadette maybe to speak about is what is the state or level of the use of smart farming uh, in Kenya? So to what degree has it been adopted? That might be useful from your perspective to, to give your thoughts on. Okay, do you want to help us answer that? Or? Uh, honestly, I don't, I don't really have the figures, but I believe that uh, it's beginning to take root. As you know yourself, you're, you already have uh, people on your system. Uh, people are using a lot of uh, phones and they're using the internet. Uh, we have farmers who are already using IoT. Uh, we have those who are using uh, things like um, uh, driverless tractors and uh, large-scale farmers uh, who are using uh, tractors that drive themselves and, and uh, they're manning them from their homes and that kind of thing. Uh, there are all sorts of uh, technologies that are already being used, but I do not have the figures and numbers of the penetration. But uh, Kenyans are already uh, knowledgeable about it and they are getting into it more and more. Mark, does that help? So I think another, them up is, uh, another question that I see is, is some people asking about uh, where are some of the locations of where the hubs have actually been deployed. So I'm interested in, in, the, in which physical ones are actually, actually operational but perhaps post COVID yes. they might be able we to We have see. A, a hub in uh, Kangema, um, Muranga that is the farm hub. Um, that is operational. We are setting up one in uh, Meru um, in a place called Gugu and uh, we have another one in Mokweni and another one coming up in Nakuru. Those are the ones that have been uh, supported by one of the uh, Gordon partners that is uh, CTA, which uh, closed down uh, its programs recently in Wakenken. Uh, but uh, those, the, the implementation of those uh, hubs is uh, continuing. And we are very hopeful that we will be having another 35 in Muranga County that has agreed to uh, all the work in the county. 
So we will actually be uh, there in a... Uh, Just control the story. Could you excuse me? Uh, perhaps to add on to that, um, as I stated, the CIHs are also connected to the ministry's program, which is the Ajira Digital Program. So I would urge um, all interested to go to ajiradigital.go.ke and under resources, you would see the, a list of the CIH centers that are actually in place. Uh, personally, I've been on the ground and in Bere South. I visited their CIH, which was uh, located at their CDF center. So that's one of the, of the operational um, CIHs I can talk about. But for more information, please go to ajiradigital.geo.ke where you can learn about the location of the CIH, CIHs and also more about the Ajira Digital Program. Uh, other than connecting uh, young people to online jobs, there's also training opportunities um, to gain digital skills, which are, of course, imperative in the, in the future of work and in curbing unemployment in the country. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Uh, Peter uh, is part of our patent participants, sorry. And uh, I believe he has a question. Uh, Peter, you can unmute yourself. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I mean, I've been with working with Upendo for some occasions, uh, especially dealing with the spatial uh, uh, data and uh, trying to improve the technology on also mainly on forage for that particular project. But also, I've been involved in some of the projects to do with agriculture, smart agriculture. Uh, but the projects I've been involved in were mainly targeted uh, low scale farm, uh, small scale farmers and who probably just have a dime to afford for such technology. Um, so what I've heard a lot about uh, the talks was across the infrastructure itself and just not very much on terms of um, how the usage has been uh, appreciated or taken by the farmers themselves. So that's why I had a few questions in terms of uh, the penetration. How, how much, what are the, so rather than the infrastructures that you see <clears throat> across in terms of hubs, in terms of uh, how this information can be accessed by farmers, but always the begging question, especially to small scale farmers, is how they actually directly uh, benefit from smart agriculture. So one of the projects we did, and probably this will just allude to the level of penetration that I experienced, and just beg the question on how they utilize it, is that we are able, other than having the infrastructures in place, we are able to send SMS messages in terms of uh, weekly information in terms of the climate, information in terms of how the welfare of the crops to the farmers themselves. But also this required a lot of campaign in terms of uh, being able to go to the ground and register those particular farmers. And this also goes in touch with what uh, Gornard uh, has been doing or has its inspirations on doing, is making sure that this information <coughs> actually reaches the farmers themselves. And once it reaches the farmers, it's up to the farmers to see whether they utilize this uh, level of information to their advantages. And one thing I've learned is that farmers also Small scale farmers can be a bit scared of change. Yeah? So they, they probably to their fathers or grandfathers, they have been doing this uh, type of farming for decades or for, for, for years on end. And how do we convince them that, yeah, well, you know, you have to change this, you have to uh, maybe put up uh, infrastructures for irrigation because the scarcity of water, this and that. But the question begs, in, whether this particular uh, smart uh, information they get, they actually utilize it to their benefits, whether they actually see it as a benefit for them, yeah, or they just look at it as information and say, okay, this is great information, but I can't utilize this information because uh, it requires me to, do, to change my way of uh, doing my practice. So I think more than just looking at the penetration in terms of infrastructure that we've built across different 
areas or, or you know networks but do actually the farmers have that attitude of seeing that the reason for change to how they do their traditional farming ways and whether because then you'll be hitting a wall with the technology that you're using to say okay yeah well this is the information you have are you going to change um, I'll just take it as another SMS of unsolicited information. <laughs> but are we actually going, are the farmers going to realize that, well, actually the information we're getting is of real value and it will actually improve our crops at uh, that level. So, so I would say the level of penetration can be in different uh, cascades. You can say the infrastructure is there, as the ICT uh, uh, government representative has said, we have put up. Uh, you know, a lot of uh, internet uh, access. Yes, we have put hubs in terms of uh, where how we can reach farmers, but are actually farmers absorbing, adapting and adopting to such uh, technology? Right. And how do we directly reach the farmers with these infrastructures? Uh, thank you very much. It's already available. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much, Peter. I think that's actually a very good question. So Bernadette, you want to address that? No, I just wanted to say that uh, Biketi here is just an example of such farmers because he is already using that technology from uh, Upande, and I know he's using other technologies, I suppose, because he's a smart farmer, and he can talk. To, he can talk for himself here again. Uh, I'm sure Mark can also point you to a, another a, a number of farmers who are doing the same. Uh, the penetration is there. It's just that personally, I don't have the figures, but mm -hmm. Biketi, you can uh, reinforce that point. Maybe Biketi is not there, but uh, I can tell them, um, other than uh, just being a farmer, I, I also promote um, adoption. And uh, one of the things that I can see, uh, my program manager is actually here, Perix Kimani, that is answering very many questions. One of the things that we have done is uh, we are dealing with another company. That our just, your special partner is a company that is based in Germany called Agribora. And they have been having a project where they have created devices IoT devices uh, that have um, mobile phone is, uh, integration, and they have uh, about uh, that, at the moment they have about thirty-five thousand farmers in uh, Western Kenya. Uh, if you go to Western Kenya and mention Agribora, you actually find that they are there. If you come to our program, we have partnered with a program of uh, IFAD that is called um, uh, Empowered Scale. And we are training farmers in what we call Jeddah Action Learning System, or GAUS. And we are taking GAUS uh, right to the farmers and households. So that because uh, when you say gender, you are talking household issues. And we train them in, in our hubs. And it is one of the content uh, that we actually deliver at our hubs. So the critical thing that uh, you have to appreciate, once you have the framework, the next thing that you must create is content. We have partnered with the Commonwealth of Learning to offer availability of free learning e-content on a, any course that you may be interested. And they have they pay for our farmers and to the Udemy platform, and you can actually learn for free Udemy programs. Recently, when COVID came, they have now partnered with Coursera. And Coursera again is offering free programs using our programs. And all we need is now. And you don't even need our hubs because these are online platforms and you can learn, but you need to register with our program. And I think uh, we can uh, discuss that one at a different point in time with other people. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, yeah, it's true that uh, everyone uh, wants to do farming and uh, the number of uh, farmers who want to venture into smart farming is increasing every day, even this uh, period of uh, COVID-19. Personally, I see so many calls and so many visitations even on my uh, on, on our farm uh, by different individuals from all walks of life. They want to know more about smart farming, how we have been able to continue carrying on with the effective production and supply uh, of our product uh, with technology. So people come and I'm generous with information. They say sharing is caring. So I, I share and uh, we, we help one another and, uh, and I talk to them. And trust me, so many people want to do uh, the new systems, want, want to do the new systems of farming. So many people, without question, they are moving out of traditional way of farming because it's not working anymore. And if you want to stick to your traditional ways of farming, 
eventually you will be forced out. If you won't just walk out yourself in peace, you will have to be kicked out by the circumstances. Okay, thank you, thank you very much, Mr. Simeon. Thank you very much, the, you amazing panelists. Yeah, this has been a great uh, discussion. We've learned so much. I believe the participants have learned as well. Kindly keep the conversation going on uh, social media with the hashtag smart farming. We will be uh, sharing this video on our YouTube and all that, and we will send you, we'll send them to you. Kindly subscribe to our YouTube channel. And uh, also, uh, look out for our next webinar. Please make sure to be there. We will organize another one, uh, maybe on the same topic or more, on, on a different one. So look out for it. Um, keep the hashtag going, the, smart, the hashtag smart farming, keep it active. I uh, would like to engage all of, uh, all of you, everyone who has a question, in case you didn't have a chance to answer, to ask right now, we would really appreciate your feedback. Uh, in case you want to reach out to us, reach out at uh, maybe info at upande.com. We'll be, we will be happy to link you up with anything, any of the presentations today, any of uh, the video, also link you up with the panelists as well. So feel free to reach out to us. Um, we are far past time, well not too far, but uh, we are, we've run out of time and I believe we have other engagements too. So I would like to maybe end this discussion here without further ado. Uh, yeah. See you soon. Thank you very much. And yes, I will get in touch with uh, Madam Baka. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much you. for being with us also. And Mr. Kiwingai as well. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you for the next deliberations. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.